What's going on in Louisville is ridiculous. I called them begging for help. There was nothing nobody can do. Nobody deserves this. It doesn't get any easier. It's crazy. Imagine your worst nightmare. We have 21 dead kids in this city. It doesn't seem like it matters what time of day it is. You turn whole families, you destroying generations. It's a very toxic cocktail. People are afraid to talk. Stop killing our babies. Something has to change. Hello and thank you for joining us for this WDRB News special, Louisville in Crisis. Tonight, an in-depth look at violent crime plaguing our city. I'm Gilbert Corsi. And I'm Fallon Blake. We have seen more shootings and more murders this year than ever before in our city's history. Increasingly, it's innocent lives lost and changed forever. Children, the elderly, people who had nothing to do with the bullets flying around them. For a month, we dispatched a team of journalists digging into this epidemic, examining where we are, how we got here, and the path forward by talking to people living it in their daily lives. And we found at the heart of this crisis, teens and young people. People, oftentimes the victims and offenders in the city's most shocking crimes. It ain't no other way other than Jesus. On any Sunday, Almighty God have mercy on us. At any corner. Just listen to Louisville between the hours of nine and noon. You hear majestic sounds of a community rejoicing. God Shouts of praise and worship fill the atmosphere from churches on almost every corner. And when you feel this spirit, he is to be it is hard to imagine that Sundays are also Louisville's most dangerous. Gunfire and murder are at their worst. Because hours before the church doors open, as ministers sleep, Mothers weep, sometimes at crimes near the steeple on the exact same street. Sunday, the day of rejoicing, starts with a chorus of heartbreak. You cannot continue going around hurting people like this. And instead of those shouts of praise and worship, this is crazy. It's agony and disbelief. You turn whole families, you destroying generations. Because Louisville's spirit is broken. I tell anybody that's going through whatever I'm going through to hold on and pray. That's all I'm doing to get back every day. Sharita Smith hadn't been to church for quite some time until <laughs> the death of her son <laughs> brought her back to say goodbye. I don't want to cry no more. I want to get justice for my son. Any cars that are available start for Hodge and Chestnut. September 22nd. Any available cars. Tyree Smith was one of three students shot in a drive-by at a school bus stop. 16-year-old Eastern High School junior died. The other two survived. I couldn't understand what just took place that fast. Smith's parents say he called home minutes after he walked out the door around 6.15 and they thought he forgot something. But the words on the other end of the line would turn out to be the last they ever heard from their son. He said, I'm dying. They said, I'm a dad. They don't believe their son, who worked at McDonald's, cut hair, and loved editing videos, was the target. They have taken a hard-working, good young man. Neither does police. This is the city of Louisville honoring Tyree Smith. At Smith's funeral, Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher gave the family a proclamation, mourning a life lost to a senseless and selfish act. Every other day we have murders on the street. Murders, murders. FBI data shows Louisville homicides steadily climbing in the last 10 years. The city hovered around 50 murders a year in 2011 and is now on track to reach 200 in 2021, a 300% increase. What's going on in Louisville is ridiculous. They're not giving this younger generation a chance to grow. We combed through the data from every homicide in 2021, 167 of them through the end of October. The results, 40% of the victims are 25 and younger. 21 are people under 18. Five people killed were under the age of 10. 75% of the homicide victims are black and the majority of the cases have happened in the city's central and west ends. And of the few arrests made, six were juveniles, the youngest, 14 years old. The person was in their car and they were shooting and I guess they couldn't see where they was aiming and they shot my sister. Were you there? Were you scared? What would you say to the person who couldn't see where they were shooting in Hidden Island? 
I would probably say that was a bad plan. Got a 16-year-old female with a GSW to the chest in front of 21 Cecil. 16-year-old Nyla Lanier died in a drive-by outside her aunt's house at a block party. Another teen was shot and survived. Kennedy draws pictures to remember her sister. When I hear Simon, it just makes me think about her. Trying to process that grief. Too young to put it into words. I keep them and I put them in my room. Why do you draw them? Because I want to put them in her room. But my mommy has a lock on her door. Candy Lanier opened Nyla's room for us. It's just as she left it that day. A load of laundry in the basket, her work clothes hung, and all the mementos of a young girl who dreamed of working in fashion still in place. She's really not coming back. Nyla's mom says it's like the day her daughter died, time stopped. To lose a child, it's like a out-of-body experience. There are many similarities between the deaths of Tyree Smith and Nyla Lanier. Both were 16. Both worked at a local McDonald's. Both of their moms kept their rooms just the same. I feel like he, his presence is in this room sometimes. Both died in a drive-by. Neither believed to be the target. In both cases remain unsolved. Your family is broken. And can't fix it. 65% of the murders in Louisville this year remain unsolved, far higher than the national average. Because people are afraid to talk. Kim Moore runs Joshua Community Connectors, a nonprofit working with young adults trying to right their lives after incarceration. With partner Sherita Smith, she provides mental health services and assistance with basic needs, housing, and employment. Until we really have a real honest conversation about where we're at as a city, Things are not going to change. The nonprofit sits on the same street in the Russell neighborhood where Tyree Smith died. A lot of things happen and people won't call the police because they don't trust them. Well, if they come, somebody might get locked up. We need to build a bridge with the community to have some collaboration with the police because all police officers are not bad. As the homicide rate increased, public trust in Louisville Metro Police waned thanks to a series of high-profile scandals. Note, the Explorer Youth Mentoring Program, three officers now convicted for sex crimes involving teens. Mama, they taking me out the vehicle. High-profile harassing stops. Black drivers pulled from their cars, handcuffed and patted down for minor traffic violations, and the police killing of Breonna Taylor. Months of protests, two officers fired, one quit, and another charged for what's been called a botched raid. Get down on your knees! Department's now down nearly 300 officers with violent crime at an all-time high. The game's lucrative right now. It's more lucrative than it's ever been. Moore says much of it centers on drugs. I, and I'm sure she does too, work with kids whose families really don't want them to come out of the game. Why would you want them to come out of the game if he's taking care of everybody? But the breadwinner. But how do we get so bad? Like, how do the numbers just explode? It's a lot of retaliation. You know, some of these people really got clouded in the streets. And so when they lose their life, you know, a lot of people got to die behind them. And that's just the reality of it. Your mind is just everywhere. Why was the mad? Who did it? Cynthia and Delnisha Hall believe retaliation led to nine-year-old Maria Hall and her eight-year-old sister being shot up in a car with their father Larry behind the wheel. Like 125 rounds that, was, that went into the car. It's, mm, it wasn't fair. Not fair. As the family says the victims were in no way part of the dispute. Cynthia Hall's home was shot up twice the night of February 1st. She says surveillance cameras captured the footage. The next day, Go ahead and notify homicide. Larry Hall and his two daughters were gunned down on Bell's Lane at the Watterson Expressway. The family believes it was a revenge hit for a shooting two months earlier here, telling us one of Larry Hall's relatives killed a person who allegedly broke into his mother's home. There's been no charges in that case. The gunman claimed self-defense. The family believes Larry, Loria, and Canary Hall paid the price. Stop killing our babies. They ain't done nothing to nobody. Only Canary survived, shot in the hip. And with no arrest and shooters this brazen, Cynthia Hall says police told her never to go back home. I was even sleeping in my car. It's an unexplainable feeling. And therein lies the trauma. These stories show how a bullet hits one person and shatters the life of the people and community around them. You traumatized everybody's life that was on this bus stop. Most people can't even walk to a bus stop anymore because y'all took someone's life. We went back to the bus stop where Tyree Smith died with his mother and 14-year-old sister. Pat was right there. 
and and then I just heard the shots and I boom and I just started running. Smith is buried just feet away from Nyla Lanier. Stuff so is too loud, I guess yeah. It's cause how close the bullets was. It was like flying past. Gun violence gets on my nerves. Cause like what is it about? It makes me mad. I'm angry that I didn't protect her. I never realized how lonely I was until she got killed. Louisville's scourge of violence is scarring a growing class of young people who've seen firsthand what most couldn't imagine. How do you help a kid with PTSD? The first thing is to create a safe space for them to feel that trust can be built. Kylan and Cassandra Gray run Creative Spirits Behavioral Health. We use an expressive therapy, narrative therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy to allow them to be able to find uh, positive ways to express themselves. Their offices are on the same block where Smith died. With Jaw Gray, we do the passing mic in the beginning and then. The couple now offers a huddle up program, weekly group counseling, free for the kids at the stop. It's treatment based in faith. They're both pastors by trade. So while Sundays bring both pain and praise, their hope rests in a fitting scripture that weeping may endure for the night. But joy comes in the morning. Coming up. Embedded with EMS in the city's most violent year. There was a crew that was shot at. When Louisville in Crisis returns. From the ambulance to the trauma room at U of L Hospital, we embedded with Metro EMS during the city's most dangerous hours, Saturday night into Sunday morning. We show you what they see on the streets and the emotions left behind. As nighttime falls over Louisville, a dark black sky blankets the streets. There are moments of silence, peace, waiting for what's to come. Things are definitely escalating. A lot more violent. The echoing sound of gunfire pierces the night air. It's a shift change at Louisville Metro EMS. Time to restock the ambulance as another crew prepares to hit the road. Just got to push through it. And into your job. A job that's growing more difficult with every call. Shocking. All right, you ready? Yeah, all right, we're all good. And so the unknown of the night begins. The job is much more than just medical calls and crashes. The violence is something that we've seen for many years. Uh, it's been a little bit more increase in the last couple years. Supervisor Major Chris Keen has Thank been with really Metro important. EMS for more than 16 years. During an overnight shift, he'll drive around the county, checking in with his crews, wearing his required bulletproof vest. And we have had some violence towards EMS. There, were, there was a crew that was shot at back in, I believe, February or March of this year. As we rode along with city EMS crews during the city's most dangerous hours, our first call, a stabbing. The race to the scene begins. Flashing lights and sirens part traffic on the way to Taylor Boulevard near Arcade Avenue. LMPD says a woman was robbed and assaulted by a stranger, then driven to this McDonald's near Churchill Downs. When they arrived, treated it with the dressing uh, over the wound uh, to control any bleeding. So they'll be transported to the hospital to be evaluated. <laughs> Almost all trauma patients are taken here to U of L Hospital. Louisville is so much more violent than most other places. Yeah, over the past year or so, we've just noticed it, it doesn't seem like it matters what time of day it is anymore. Now it just it seems like it's throughout the entire day. Then another call. This time a shooting back near Churchill Downs, fourth and central. As I'm pulling up, you know, looking around, seeing what's around, see where the crowds of people are. Police say they found a man shot at this location. Our priority is exposing the wounds and bleeding control. Then it's back to the emergency department. 
through these doors, trauma victims are hurried into what's called room nine. I don't remember the last shift I've had where we did not have at least one victim of a gunshot wound. Unfortunately, we're seeing that all too often uh, every day. Uh, I think multiple times a day. LMPD reports show this year at least 32% of non-fatal shootings and nearly 37% of homicides occurred on the weekends. 226 people injured or dead through the end of October, and that is just from the weekends. Oh, I don't know what can be worse than losing someone you love. Nicole Coward knows that feeling too well. She's back in the place. <laughs> where her son spent some of his final moments alive. It's like it happened yesterday. Being in this room where my son was brought to, I don't know which bed it was, but I know he was he was in room nine. Her son Dookie was shot at his school bus stop almost three years ago. I'm not okay. Not okay at all. He died at the hospital. She shares her story saying she doesn't want another mother to hear their child is in room nine. I could save one that I didn't done what I was supposed to do. But it's not easy. And every day is a struggle. It's one of the hardest things that I have to do is live without my son. The heartache never goes away. It's real, raw emotion that rips your heart out. This is what the killers are doing to far too many families. Nobody deserves this. Nobody deserves to play God and take people's lives. A city at war, waiting, hoping, praying for change. Louisville's a very beautiful city and has a lot to offer. As medical staff and families hold the line. It's difficult sometimes to see the beauty from our perspective because we see the ugly so often. Coming up. And they're fearless. It's a very toxic cocktail. Second chances, bad outcomes. Arrested 20, 30 times. The impact of sweeping changes to juvenile justice laws in Kentucky. Does diversion work for kids? Next. Chris. <laughs> Chris was one of a kind. 17 years old. If you knew him, then you would love him. I heard the front door close. Um, and I just kind of thought in my head, well, there goes Chris. It was the last time Chris would ever be home with his mom. It was like at 11.45, I hear this banging at my door. She says, can I come in? And I'm like, no, who are you? And she was like, I'm the deputy coroner, and when she said that, like I already knew. One of those bullets hit Chris. Chris Ward is just one face in the sea of teenagers who have died by the trigger in Louisville. He's also one of many who have walked through these doors into juvenile court. But what happens here, the public never sees. 2014 saw an overhaul of the juvenile justice system in Kentucky like never before, Senate Bill 200. And the whole point of Senate Bill 200 was to front load services to these children 
at the low end of the justice system, so the least serious offenses, and try to divert as many of those kids from the court system at all. State Senator Whitney Westerfield was the author of the bill supported and praised by both Republicans and Democrats. It allowed youth charged with nonviolent, non-sexual crimes to avoid court and jail entirely. Are you guilty or not guilty, sir? going through diversion programs instead. It's a Frederick Douglass quote, and I say it and I talk about it a lot. It really is the guiding principle behind Senate Bill 200. It's easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. That principle reshaped how Judge Jessica Moore deals with kids who land in her courtroom. Does diversion work for kids? I think it does. We don't want youth reoffending. We want them to have access to services. But in some cases, kids who commit low-level crimes and avoid court and jail went on to commit worse crimes. It's a cycle trauma therapist Shawita Smith witnessed over and over. Before the Senate bill got passed, we could revoke their probation if they're breaking curfew, um, substance use, and all that. They only had so many chances. But after the Senate bill, they're like, okay, you go to this treatment, you go here. If that do doesn't work, you go over here. Before Senate Bill 200, a juvenile could be arrested for up to two misdemeanors before going to jail. Now, a juvenile could commit three misdemeanors and a felony before ever seeing a jail cell. So what does the data say? On average, there have been 104 more diversions a month since Senate Bill 200 passed. In Louisville, it's a 16.1% increase since 2014. 10 months after diversion, 7% of kids will commit another crime. Without diversion, it's 16%. But the amount of times a kid is rearrested for a violent crime after diversion has gone up. And at least one of the six teenagers arrested for murder in Louisville this year was on diversion at the time. Where is the line? Well, the answer to that is that it depends. Each kid is different. Each kid's learning experience is different. The Louisville Youth Detention Center closed on January 1st, 2020 because of a city budget crunch. The jail was defunded and the state said it was too expensive to keep open. Now, kids are shipped all over Kentucky. It creates a whole different set of challenges when deciding whether a kid should go to jail. I was the uh, mental health treatment coordinator at JCYC before they shut down. So once they shut down, they start sending the kids to the camps. I had several kids, as soon as they come out of camp, two, three months later, they're dead. I obviously take into consideration, does that youth have family support? Are there stable family members that could take them? Do I have a degree of comfort thinking that they would not reoffend, that they can follow the court's orders? Those difficult decisions affect the criminals and the victims. Time doesn't help. It still feels like yesterday. Chris was one of those victims. When he was shot, he was on probation and wore an ankle monitor. As a mother, like, having these things into place was, in my mind, shaping him back up. His mom wanted more punishment for Chris, fearing her son could land in even more trouble. And it was even worse than she imagined. I called them mo a month and a half before Chris was murdered, begging and pleading for help. And there was nothing nobody can do. Do you think that he would still be alive if those consequences were enforced? Yes. It led to the most heartbreaking night of her life. Whenever I called his probation officer that night, the probation officer says, I don't even see where he's outside of the house. No one's ever going to get it right 100% of the time. At the end of the day, our objective is to make our commonwealth safer. And we don't always get it right. I mean, but the goal is to do what's best for the youth and best for the community, but we can only do the best we can. Coming up, pinpointing gang battle line. Right here is one of the more active areas. And the man trying to break them down. Plus, we have 21 dead kids in the city. One on one with Louisville's police chief, and she's not holding back. We can't just keep saying that we're going to be compassionate and somehow this problem's going to resolve itself. When Louisville in Crisis returns. Welcome back to this WDRB News special, Louisville in Crisis. Tonight we take an in-depth look at the violent crime epidemic plaguing our city. It's fueled by guns, drugs, and gangs. WDRB's Valerie Chin pinpoints the battle lines and the effort to get young people out of the game on the streets. 
They know these streets. See, I've been doing this for so long, almost every spot that I drive through, I can pretty much remember somebody being popped in that area. What would you say is the most dangerous street in Louisville? Right now, 22nd Street. Driving through neighborhoods. I do my rounds in the daytime a lot. It seems quiet now. This particular area right here is one of the more active areas, uh, individuals who uh, represent this area over here. This is a uh, Southwick area. So most of the cats who stay up all night, they're sleeping right now. Sleeping during this time of day, you know, they come out about 6 o'clock. Dr. Eddie Woods, known as Doc to many, is with No More Red Dots, a group focused on stopping gun violence. This is one of the little areas that we pay attention to right here at this particular corner. Yeah, 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 he knows. Dots on these maps mark each homicide and shooting in the most violent year in Louisville's history. Ruin was hot as a firecracker between between this block and 26th Street. We had we had four four shootings, three three deaths, six overdoses, death overdoses on that one block. Woods led us through neighborhoods where gang activity is rampant. Bottom line is we got to police ourselves. We got to take care of ourselves. These four corners blazing at one point. Cecil in Greenwood, home to the CNG gang. Young people do what's, what they call sliding. Sliding is riding through neighborhoods looking for individuals that uh, they got specific neighborhoods, but looking for individuals that they consider to be their opponent or ops, okay? So the whole process is called going on a drill. And so when they go on these drills, they're looking for somebody to shoot. Wood saying there are 19 identified gangs in Louisville. A lot of them are neighborhood groups that are affiliated with each other. We have to count them all. We can't, we can't just go by what, what uh, are nationally known groups Crips, Bloods, and like that, you know, we pretty much know them by neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, and, and really, that's not as much of, of our focus as, um, as just stopping the homicides and the shootings. You've been doing this for decades. Right. What have you seen? What's the change in Louisville? Why is the violence worse now than before? It's got more to do with with social media and, and, and availability of weapons. Social media wars that lead to violence in the streets. Somebody get on social media, record some talking about one neighborhood, but then you got somebody that's around them that will take and send it to the people that they talking to talking about, and it's going back and forth instigating. 22nd Street is very, very busy right now. You know, um, different, different folks got got issues with each other and so one of the things that, that 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 we have to have to contend with is we really don't care a whole lot about the issues you know but why don't you fight instead of shoot you know that's kind of how, how how we how we view it you know um and some of the issues have to do with gang activity have to do with drug activity have to do with individual and personal beef. And Wood says that's a dangerous combination with so many guns on the streets. We're not even talking about 22s and, and things like that. We're talking about real guns. We're talking about big guns. You know, folks are able to get guns that, that will be in the military. You know, uh, stuff with a, with, with a half mile scope on it. They don't even have to be standing in your face to do something to you. You know the police is here. The No More Red Dots team coming up with strategies to try and get people to put the guns down. The organization saying it's getting about $400,000 to help with the Cure Violence Initiative in the Portland neighborhood to address shootings and homicides. Wood says the people who live here often prefer to talk to his organization instead of police. What they do is let us know when somebody's doing too much, when an individual is need somebody to talk to because he's like doing too much, you know. So so we'll set up an opportunity to talk with him. The Cure Violence Strategy places people who have been incarcerated as interrupters to do direct outreach, boots on the ground in the city's most dangerous communities. It's had controversial results in the past with partners charged with more crimes. But the city is putting more money in public safety than ever before. Normally, we will find out 
what a problem is and basically try to come in between of it with some kind of truce, uh, sit down, you know, to resolve it. Uh, you know, like a private meeting, it ain't, it was never nothing broadcast. How open are people to talking to you about those kind of things? Are uh, they very open because like I said, we come from the streets. Metro Council just allocated $15 million to the Office of Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods for crime reduction programs, tackling addiction, trauma, and violence intervention. Rontel Shepard says he's able to connect with others because he's a victim of gun violence himself. All I can say about that, so it was just a little mis misunderstanding. Where were you shot? Uh, in my back. The former high school football player lived in the Shepherd Square housing project and met Woods when he was around 12 years old, and it changed his life. What do you think needs to happen for this violence to stop in this community? Uh, I believe it's, it's going to take us and a lot of the parents, because I believe a lot of the parents pretty much know what's going on with their kids. And the team hopes to teach kids about opportunities that have nothing to do with gangs or violence. What we do is try to get the person who's out there on the streets doing street stuff to be involved in either our mentorship program with one of our, one of our uh, team members and or to be involved in some of the programs that we got that can pay them extra some money. I know we ain't going to stop the shooting, but we can try to stop as much of it as we can. What happens in the streets ends up in our schools. Ain't no security in the Fights, guns on campus, and explosive scenes like this. Educators point to unsolved trauma and beefs on social media. It's a vicious cycle and why JCPS added mental health counselors at every campus. So many schools are going through trauma trainings to become trauma informed, to really be able to help these students, not only in, say, a counseling session, but for teachers to know, how can I support this student? LMPD wants better communication with schools to combat what's happening there and on the streets. So what's the holdup? We talk about it in my one-on-one -on -one interview with Chief Erica Shields, and nothing was off limits. LMPD under federal investigation, 300 officers short, and dealing with an overwhelming amount of crime. Our homicide rate is wholly unacceptable. LMPD Chief Erica Shields has been outspoken about what's causing so much violence in our community. Our approach has been, okay, we know we have gangs driving violence. Let's go and try to target those individuals who are funding these gangs and who are recruiting these kids into their gangs. Shields says there are about 10 formal gangs in Louisville, not including all the neighborhood gangs. The FBI is saying part of the strategy to fight crime is taking down entire gangs. Recent indictment and arrest of several members of a local street gang. Recently, the feds and LMPD announced the indictment of 10 members of the Everybody Shine Together gang for guns and drugs. But how much of a difference did breaking up the EST gang make? I think that, of course, you're always, you're always going to be in a space where there's people that are going to want to step in and fill the void. But to the extent that you can really go after those individuals who are funding it, um, it's imperative you do that. Maybe people are stepping in, but we have to go after them. Take a look at this map. The green dots represent all the shootings and the blue squares all the homicides so far this year. We just have to figure out a way to do a better job of getting our arms around the people who are driving this violence and holding them accountable. That also scares people when they hear about carjackings happening in all parts of town, doesn't matter where you live. What do you say to those people who are really changing how they do daily life because they are in fear? That we are making really solid arrests we're getting these folks locked up. Chief Shield says legal gun owners are contributing to crime, leaving weapons in their unlocked cars. Unless you are willing to drill down on how do we manage the flow of guns into our communities, I think you're always going to be playing catch up at some level. And the guns also being found in several schools, including Pleasure Ridge Park, Seneca, Doss, Liberty and Iroquois High Schools and Stewart Academy. We're encountering kids every day who are in gangs and or have guns. It's just, it's become the norm. We're not getting any feedback on what is transpiring during that school day. We need to know who has, what conflict has broken out. We need to know, you know, who's planning to retaliate against whom. 
later in the day because whatever is transpiring in the school during that eight or 10 hours is going to make its way back to the community. Shield says it's not that JCPS isn't sharing the information. She says there's no one collecting the intel that could be used to stop the violence after they leave school. For the past few months, the city of Louisville has been working on a new approach to stop ongoing violence. It's called Group Violence Intervention, or GVI. It's essentially our police going out and trying to interrupt the violence. So if I get shot, they're going to come to you because you're my friend and say, we know you want to retaliate, just don't. And then the city's um, ocean folks come in with the nonprofit support to try to provide you with some wraparound services to redirect where your life's going. Organizers say it has helped reduce crime in other cities and hope it also will in Louisville, where officers are stretched thin. What I would love to have more availability for officers for is bike squad and footbeat. I think that those two things provide, they provide you the ability to do community policing while legitimately fighting crime. You'd like to be able to have the folks to be able to respond when someone wants you all the time, but we're just, we're not in that space. Fewer people are going into policing nationwide and recruiting an even bigger challenge in Louisville with high profile cases like the death of Breonna Taylor, creating issues with public trust. Those incidents that have transpired here over the last five or so years, y you, have to, you have to understand that, that yes, there's a reason they're here. She says people have to get out of the mindset that Louisville is a smaller city. And how we target LMPD specifically, how we target some of this activity. Some of the courts have not, they've just, they're doing their own thing and seem oblivious to, to what is occurring. Um, you know, the schools need to be able to be a part and have open, honest conversation. And she says these uncomfortable conversations need to happen to spark change. We have 21 dead kids in the city. We can't just keep saying that, you know, we're going to we're going to be compassionate and somehow this problem is going to resolve itself. I want my healers to do one thing. Making a difference one child at a time. And what keeps me up at night is violent crime. Getting answers from Louisville's mayor. Do you think that you should have pushed for police reform before 2020? When Louisville in Crisis returns. It's a truly pivotal moment in our city's history. As Louisville Mayor Greg Fisher winds down his third and final term in office, how will he be remembered? Job growth? Big deals that change the city's landscape. What keeps me up at night is violent crime. Perhaps that will define his legacy as mayor. It's investments in prevention and intervention, reentry, in addition to the police department. Has figuring it out successfully, has that been your biggest challenge as mayor? We're not where I want it to be right now. While homicides rose nationally 30% in 2020, murders and Louisville nearly doubled. And the incline's been steady, up threefold the last decade. Is there a particular murder that sticks out in your head, the one that kind of haunts you as mayor? Um, they're all, I'm not going to say one more than the other. The, the triple homicide that took place in May of 2012. <laughs> a shooting at a shooting sent neighbors running for cover at 32nd and Greenwood on May 17, 2012. It happened in front of police who were already there for a homicide when gunfire broke out again, ending with three people dead. When that took place, you can remember the, the city was like, that's not us, what's taking place here. But that year we had about 50 murders, and now we're about to have 200. If that's not Louisville, then where are we now? This is a big question, right, is how do we get this under control uh, here in our city? How do we have sensible gun laws? How do we get the family element of this to, so that if you know your young son has a gun in his backpack that you're saying, son, we can't allow that to take place. Department of Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods was meant to be an answer. It was created after that shooting in 2012 to serve as a hub for crime intervention and prevention programs, but it faltered. The first director promised to cut crime by 25% in five years. It didn't happen. After three directors in eight years, homicides continued to soar. I wish it was as simple as one department being able to do what they need to do to take away all violent crime. So it's a combination of funding, 
having the right staffing in place. And really this year, 2021, is the first time we have the adequate funding that I hope will do the job. Fisher says $80 million in additional money will go to violence prevention programs in Louisville this year. Money may not solve all problems. Follow the facts and the law wherever they lead. The Department of Justice now investigating LMPD. What? Officers under intense spotlight ever since police killed Breonna Taylor in a raid. It opened up the force to a world of scrutiny, change, and protest. No justice! How do you think the deterioration of public trust has added to the problem? The deterioration of public trust impacts the closure rate on homicides. There were complaints about transparency, truthfulness for a long time with LMPD. Do you think that you should have pushed for police reform before 2020? Well, I thought we were having police reform with uh, 21st century policing, and we went through all of those uh, mechanisms to do that. Obviously, White House said you guys are doing a great job. So you were under the belief that um, the efforts that were put in place were successful and were working? When I have outside validation that's telling me that, you know, I believe it is. New Chief Erica Shields recently told Metro Council it will take a long time to heal those wounds. The wrongdoing and the missteps and the damage to the community is very real. And I'm not sure we're done pulling back some of the, the, the layers either. The top-down audit of the police department revealed officers don't want to work for LMPD. 75% said they would quit if they could. The department now down 300 officers. What we've here is more it's pay issues than anything else. Is it as simple as dollars and cents? Because what the survey told us that they, is that they did not trust the leadership. Right. And leadership there's is, some onus on that there. You're part of leadership. You are the mayor of this city. <laughs> Your officers are there's video walked out on you last well, year. Well, you know, and that you guys have run with that forever. Proud moment. And that's not a true story. I walked in from another room as, as the roll call was being dismissed. And then you guys blow that up to them walking out on me. I don't want to hear nothing you have to say, Mr. Mayor. Witnesses who were there told a different account. They all got up and left. Do you understand? that there are officers who feel unsupported by your leadership. And what would be your response to those officers? In a group of a thousand police officers, there are going to be some that don't agree with the decisions that I make. I understand that. But you would say, what do I believe in? Constitutional policing. What do I believe in? Due process. All of our police officers get due process. Do they get everything that they want? No, that they, no they don't. But I'm there to support them when they do their job. One year left to write his legacy as mayor. Will history remember Greg Fisher? How long until we see tangible results? When can the public expect to see our homicide rate go down? I would, you know, I would hope a year from now we'll be seeing some improvement. Families have got to do their job. The state legislature has got to do its job as well. It's, it's more than just looking at government to solve all their problems. We're going to do everything we can, but this has got to be an all-in strategy from everybody in the community. Coming up, good boy. Hope for tomorrow. The neighborhood she live in don't have to be her life. Breaking the cycle of violence one child at a time. When Louisville in Crisis returns. For the past hour, we have shown you the overwhelming impact of crime in our community. But tonight, we want to end with hope. WDRB's Chris Suter shows us how the people who have been hit the hardest still find promise in tomorrow. Fall in Louisville. The leaves slowly changing from green to shades of red and hues of yellow. For Krista Gwen and her family, that first chill of the changing season meant it'd be time to celebrate soon. He's a Thanksgiving baby. Her son. Christian Gwen, Chris for short. Mom and Dad were so thankful. Chris was special. I kissed you under the stars, but it wasn't good enough. He'd grow up to give rapping a try. Like you won't, but you still say I do the most. But and develop other big dreams. He tried being a brick mason and firefighter in the job corps. He was on his way. But that's as far as it ever got. That cool fall breeze seems cruel now. Every time it comes around, the family is forced to face what happened to their Christian. December 19th was the day my son was murdered in a drive-by shooting. He didn't sell drugs, he owed nobody nothing. So why would you say, I turned that corner to shoot that boy? The immeasurable heartache, hard to bear, but it was far from over. 
The next painful chapter starting with a text. I still got it on my phone. She texts me, Mom, and I answer what? She said, get to me. I got shot. It was Victoria, their daughter. It was just boom, 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 boom. Shots fired in Ballard Park. It was broad daylight. 200 something rounds in a park. Victoria was hit. It, it happened just so fast. She turned around to watch in horror as the friend who helped her navigate the tragedy of losing her brother, Dewan Coward, was dying. These kids out here nowadays, they're not even making it to adulthood before they even taken a bullet or losing their life. Two of the Gwen's children were hit by bullets, but they were not the only victims. My 13 year old, who is a victim also. The couple's youngest, Nevada, named after dad, finds it comforting to hold her brother's urn. She lives with trauma every day. She liked to sit with him. These are her formative years and a distraction from what she'd been through was clutch. They found it. The future healers is what will help her. Community activist Christopher 2X's organization. We can create a narrative about hope and healing. Attack! As you can tell, Nevada loves animals. Yeah. She's always said she want to be a vet. And in addition to tutorials from UofL doctors showing kids what it takes to work in a hospital, Future Healers is also looking to collaborate with the Louisville Zoo to get an up-close look at caring for the furry residents here. They get to come into the animal kingdom, per se, and actually be healers in there, too. Yes, youth is where problems with violence start in Louisville. Every day, victims and killers get younger, but it is far from the end of the problem. Clearly. Homicide numbers continue to skyrocket. Monique Williams is the director of the Office for Safe and Healthy Neighborhoods. This is a community issue. This is an all people issue. There are several outreach initiatives and programs under the umbrella of her organization. We have our Pivot to Peace initiative. We have our hospital-based violence intervention program. But the people surrounded by a cycle of violence are not exactly eager to take part in the programs to stop it. Williams believes preconceived notions of government-led organizations are stunting potential progress. There's some justified mistrust there, and I think it's our job to rebuild that. More funding and staff for organization recently got along with educating people about its efforts will help. But Williams ultimately thinks there has to be a shift in the way everyone thinks. People aren't really understanding when we say, you know, violence is a public health issue. And while we address it in that way, it's hard to support the kinds of strategies that come out of that space. Big moves start with hope. You don't have to look further than the youngest member of the Gwen family for that. Her heart is given, and her heart is nature, nurturing. She's seen the worst of the world up close and still dares to dream. The neighborhood she live in don't have to be her life. With some helping hands, paws. Sucks. And a lot of smiles. The future vet's heartache will not halt the heart she still has for a better tomorrow. Good boy. This violent crime epidemic cut a deep wound in Louisville. It wasn't one problem, and it didn't happen overnight. Likewise, it may take a long time to heal, and we hope our community is starting that journey right now. For all of us here at WDRB News, we thank you for joining us. Good night.